Hey guys, what is up? It's me, it's Anna, and today I've got a new video for you guys. Today I have a sapphic book recommendations video for you guys because I just felt like filming one because I've read a lot of like sapphic books, a lot of sapphic books, and I just wanted to share with you guys what my favorite sapphic books were. Um, as you can see, I've got a whole pile of books right here. So we've got a few to get through and I've got my laptop with some notes on the book right here um, because it's been a while since I've read some books so I need to use some notes. <laughs> but without further ado, let's go to the first book. First book on the pile is One Last Stop by Casey McQuiston. Let me just tell you, I absolutely love this book. I read this book in one day and I literally just fell in love with her writing. I love Red, White and Royal Blue and I had to get this one. Her new book is going to be out on May 3rd. I'm, I'm getting that one too. I'm going to go to a book signing on May 3rd and I'm going to get her new book. So I'm very excited. This is an LGBTQIA plus romance and it's a contemporary book. This book is about August. She is a 23 year old bisexual who moves to New York City. Uh, she moves in with Nico, Myla and Wes. Nico is a psychic medium and is a part-time bartender. Myla is an artist who makes art out of bones, which is very interesting. Nico and Myla are dating and they're really cute together. And Wes is a tattoo artist who is in love with their across the hall neighbor Isaac? Is I oh, uh, Asaya, who is a drag queen that goes by the name Any Depressant. August has to pay her rent somehow, so she gets a job at Pancake Billy's and she's also still in college. And then one day when she's on her way to college to take her classes, she meets Jane on the subway. Jane is a punk lesbian from the 1970s who is stuck in time. August starts developing a crush on Jane. August um, attempts to use her detective skills to find out why Jane is stuck on the subway car and she wants to figure out how she can get Jane from the subway car. This book is sapphic. It's so, so, so good. I loved every single second of this book. It's so good. It's my favorite book. No joke. Yeah. <laughs> All right, on to the next book. The next book on the pile is Last Night at the Telegraph Club by Melinda Lowe. This book was so cute. This book was fucking adorable. I loved this book. Um, seriously, this book is so cute. This book is about a 17 year old Lily Hu who lives in Chinatown in San Francisco. One day she meets Kathleen Miller and she starts questioning her sexuality in 1954. Yeah, 1954 is a dangerous year for two girls to fall in love, which is why this book was heartbreaking, but also so cute. Lily's father is on the cusp of getting deported, even though he earned his green card to stay and work here, um, which makes it even more dangerous for Lily to fall in love with, a, with another woman. Um, and Kathleen introduces Lily to the queer world, um, she takes her to different queer bars, introduces her to a lot of her queer friends, and Lily's own friends warn Lily to stay away from Kathleen because she is dangerous and she is not a good person to hang around with. Um, like I said, this book was so cute. I absolutely loved it. It was also very heartbreaking at some points. There. This book is a romance. It's LGBTQIA+. It's historical and it's a young adult book. Next on the pile, we have got The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo by Taylor Jenkins Reid. This book is a romance. It's LGBTQIA+, and it's a historical book. Um, this book is about Monique Grant, who is a reporter for Vivint magazine. I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it. I think it is. One day she gets asked by Evelyn Hugo to write her 
life story. Monique is very confused about why she asked her. And once Monique gets there, she discovers that Evelyn does not want to do a interview for Vivint the magazine, but she wants to talk to Monique specifically and wants her to release this article under her own name and not under Vivint magazine's name. While they talk and while Evelyn tells her story and while Monique writes it down, she discovers why Evelyn had seven husbands. When Evelyn is almost done telling her story, Monique learns why Evelyn specifically requested her and why she wants Monique to release it under her own name instead of Vivint Magazine's name. I, this book was really, really good and I really recommend this book. Next on the list, we got a fairy tale retelling which is called Cinderella is Dead. And I think you guys can figure out which fairy tale retelling this is. This is a fairy tale retelling for Cinderella. This book is a romance, it's LGBTQIA+, it's a fantasy, and it is young adult. In this retelling of Cinderella, teen girls are required to go to the annual ball where they get picked by men to basically marry them and have their kids. Um, this story follows Sophia. She is 16 and she has reached the age where she is where she can attend her first ball too but she'd rather marry her childhood best friend Aaron than marry a guy. <laughs> so while she's at the ball she tries to escape and because she really does not want to marry a fucking guy who just picks her because of her looks. Sophia tries to flee while she's at the ball where she ends up in one of Cinderella's this word is a really hard word so bear with me. I apologize in advance. Muse Museoliums? Probably pronounce it so wrong. Um, yeah, she flees and she ends up in one of Cinderella's museoliums. <laughs> and there she meets Constance, who is the last known descendant of Cinderella's stepsisters. Girls who don't get picked at this ball, once they reach the age of 18 and they haven't been picked yet, they disappear and are just never to be heard of again. Once Sophia meets Constance, her and Constance try to figure out what happens to those girls who don't get picked and they discover a very, very dark secret about the king and basically the whole kingdom and just what's going on with that. Um, it was the first fairy tale retelling that I ever read and I really recommend it. It was amazing. It was really good. Next up, we've got a duology, Crier's War and Ironheart. They're both romance LGBTQIA+, uh, fantasies and young adult. After the War of Kinds, Otome, who are made by nobles and queens and kings as sort of their play things, kind of run the country and bend humans to their will because they're better than humans. Isla is trying to rise through the ranks as a human servant in the governor's house to take revenge on him because he killed her family. Her plan of revenge is killing his daughter, Lady Cryer. Um, and like I said, she's climbing through the ranks as a human servant, which ended up her becoming the maid of Lady Cryer. Isla's plan is to kill Lady Cryer and get the fuck out of there, get revenge on the stupid Southerner because Southern whatever, because he killed her family and he wants, she wants him to feel the same pain she felt when her family got killed. But once she turns into Lady Cryer's maid, she learns that Lady Cryer is not at all what she thought she would be. And it ends up being a lot harder for her to actually go through with killing Lady Cryer. While Isla is planning to kill Lady Cryer, Lady Cryer has a whole thing, has her own problems. Um, her father is a very, very important man who runs this circle of very important people, and Lady Cryer has always dreamt of joining that circle. Um, so, what she wants is for her father to see her as an equal and actually have her join this circle. But she discovers that her father does not see her as an equal and that her father isn't the man she thought he was. 
Um, she gets betrothed to Sire Kinnock, who is also not who she thought he was. While all this is going on, she obviously meets Isla because Isla becomes her maid. Meeting Isla just kind of throws everything she wants to do, like, upside down. Also funny because I have not tapped this book, but then we go to Ironheart, which is written by Nina Filera, just like Cryer's War. And this one is tapped. This whole thing is going to contain spoilers for Cryer's War, so if you don't, if you haven't read Cryer's War yet, skip to this part of the video where I'm going to discuss the next book and you won't get any spoilers for Cryer's War. In this book, Isla and Cryer attempt to find the Iron Heart and want to destroy it. Isla's reason for wanting to destroy it is because she wants to get rid of all the anime because they have caused her so much pain. So she wants to destroy the Iron Heart so that the anime don't have any life source anymore and they basically just die a very very slow death. She escaped Lady Cryer's palace so now she is a, fug a fugitive so people are looking for her. Isla is also the heart of the Yuma revolution who are fighting against the Otome to literally wipe all of them out. She pledged her alliance to Queen Jun who wants to help her get rid of the Iron Heart as well. So even though Isla wants to destroy the Iron Heart and get rid of all the anime, she has to make a tough choice because getting rid of the Iron Heart also means that Cryer will also die since she's also an anime and she can't really she is she's finding it very difficult to actually destroy the Iron Heart because she's in love with Cryer. What she does not know is that Cryer has also escaped the palace and is now also a fugitive and wanted and everybody's looking for her. And Cryer also really wants to destroy the Iron Heart. And then they both end up in the same prison. And once they're there, they discover that they're in the prison, which is very close to the Iron Heart. And once they're there, the two of them discover a very, 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 very dark secret about the Iron Heart and what has been going on for years and they both have to find a way to destroy the Iron Heart and figure out how to keep the anime alive without it. Again, this book was so, so good. I really, really liked this book. I read it in a few days and as you can see, I tabbed this book. Next on the list, we have got Satisfaction Guaranteed. This book is a LGBTQIA plus romance. It's a happy-go-lucky story and it's very cute. This story is about Kate. Her dead aunt has left her her sex toy store and her house. Um, in the backyard of this house, there's this woman living. Um, her name is Selena. Her name is Selena. Selena has lived with Kate's aunt for a very long time. She has also worked for Kay's aunt for a very long time in the sex toy store. Um, and this story is about how the both of them have to work together to keep the sex toy store from going bankrupt. They discovered that the toy store has not been doing well and her aunt left the store to Kate because she knew that Kate is a very, very good businesswoman and she knows that Selena loves working at the store. So they both have to work together to make sure that the store doesn't go bankrupt. Um, so they go through a lot, a lot of things together to make sure that this store does not get shut down. Kate and Selena have 30 days to come up with the plan, but and it's not as easy as it looks. Two things are not as easy as it looks. Working together and coming up with the plan. This story, this this, this book, this book was a good book. Um, I really, really liked it. Next up, we've got Malice. Um, I don't have the book as a physical copy. It is on my Kindle. So I'll just put a picture of the book up right here, which is a LGBTQIA plus romance and it's a fantasy and this again is a fairy tale retelling uh, but this time it's a fairy tale retelling of sleeping beauty alice is um, a grace who lives in the kingdom of briar and graces like her um, possess magical gifts they work for nobles in briar and they have to create elixirs Alice is not like the typical racist because she's got Philip blood in her veins. 
Giving her this um, this fill of blood makes her one of the most powerful graces, and she is therefore known as the Dark Grace. Since she is the Dark Grace, she is forced to create curses, or she's gonna get killed by the king, basically. So she literally has no other option than to make curses or die, which is, you know, a fun choice. Every single year they throw a ball for Princess Aurora because she got cursed, and her curse the curse will put her to sleep once she is 16. So every single year they throw this ball where she meets tons of princes and nobleties from around the world um, to find her actual true love and to break this spell. But so far they haven't had any luck. And Aurora's 16th birthday is coming up very close. So the stakes are pretty high. Alice has never ever been to one of these balls because she's a dark race and she's not invited because people are very scared of her. But one time she decides that she's had enough, so she's like, fuck you guys, I'm gonna go to the ball. So she goes to the ball where she meets Princess Aurora. So the two grow closer, they start discovering things about each other and it's really cute, they're having a lot of fun, but then when her parents, when Aurora's parents discover that she's been hanging out with the dark race, they're not happy and they basically like force her to stop seeing her which makes neither of them happy so they start sneaking around and then at one point something happens which results in Alice having to choose between good or bad and if, and if she's gonna be the person she wants to be or if she's gonna be the person that everybody believes she is. Like I said, this book was so good. I really liked it. Uh, now we're on to the next book, which is Sweet and Bitter Magic by Adrian Tooley. This is an LGBTQIA plus romance. It's a fantasy and it is young adult. This book is a dual point of view. It's about Tamsin and Ren. Tamsin is the most powerful witch in her generation but got exiled by the coven for using dark magic and she got cursed as well. Her curse is that she can't love. She does not feel love. Nothing. She's, she doesn't feel any love whatsoever. So when people go to her, payment she asks, asks for is love so that she can feel a little bit of love from time to time because everybody needs to feel a little bit of love, you know? <laughs> um, yeah, her payment is love and every single time someone asks something for her, from her, they have to give her the love they feel for this person. Um, Ren is a source and sources are people who are born witches but can't practice the craft itself and are just sort of like amplifiers for witches. Um, when they work together, they are just- the witch is stronger. As soon as the sources discover their abilities, they're supposed to get taught by the coven. Um, but Ren has chosen to take care of her father, who has become very, very ill after her mother died. Then a plague starts running their town. And once her father becomes victim of this plague, Ren decides that she wants to do something about it. So she goes to the most powerful witch she knows, which is Tamsin. Um, they both have to work together and neither of them are happy about it, but they both want to get rid of this plague. Ren proposes a bargain and Tamsin accepts. If Tamsin helps her catch the witch who is responsible for this plague, then she'll give all the love she has for her father. But while the two work together to find the dark witch and to get rid of this plague, they unravel a dark truth about someone in the coven. Yeah, it took me a while to get into this book, but it was a great book. I really, really liked it, so I really recommend this book. Um, and it's also an enemies to lovers, just like the last one. So if you're really into enemies to lovers, you'll really like this book. The next one, this is how you lose time war. This is a very, very small, short book, as you can see. It's a romance, it's LGBTQIA+, and it's sci-fi. This book is about red and blue, and they're basically rival agents. Red works for the agency, and the agency works for a time 
where technology has taken over every single thing and Blue belongs to the garden who fight for a time where there's no technology in the world whatsoever. Um, yeah, so this is basically, like I said, this is basically a time war. Red and blue have absolutely nothing in common except for the fact that they're both the best agents in their factions. And being alone is unfortunately also one of the only things that they have in common. <laughs> um, writing letters to each other started off as like a fun like battlefield boost but has slowly turned into something dangerous, which could end up in killing both of them. This book was amazing. It's, they just write letters to each other and it was, oh, it was so, so, so good. I read this, this is the first book I read with the uh, Savlodis and this book was just, I really, really liked this book. So, and then we got another big one. We've got Plain Bad Heroines by Emily M. Danforth. This is an LGBTQIA plus book and it's also a horror. The story in this book goes on in the past and it goes on in the present. Um, there's like two different stories going on at the same time in this book. Um, the book starts up in 1902 at the Brookhands School for Girls. If Flo and Clara, who are both students at this school. They are obsessed with each other and they are obsessed with a daring young writer named Mary McLean, the author of a scandalous best-selling memoir. They want to show their devotion to Mary, so they establish their own private club which is called the Plain Bed Heroines Society. This club meets up in secret in the apple orchard where the bodies of Flo and Clara are later discovered with a copy of Mary McLean's book. Beside them, and five years after their death, the school closes the door forever after more peculiar deaths have happened on their grounds. A century later, this abandoned school will become the background to a Hollywood production inspired by a book written by young writer Merit Emmons. Um, she has published a breakout book celebrating the career feminist history surrounding the haunted and cursed Gilded Age institution, aka the Brookhead School for Girls. This horror film is going to star a lesbian it girl Harper Harper as Flo and B-list actress Audrey Wells as Clara. As soon as Brooke Hans opens its gate again, the past and the present become entangled and it gets impossible to tell if the things that are happening are just Hollywood magic or if the school is really haunted. Um, this book was really good. I really, really liked this book. I was like, ugh, give me more when I was done. Like, I loved it. I loved it. I loved it so much. It was a great book and I really, really recommend it. Even though it's a big one, you're gonna like it. <laughs> and then last but definitely not least, we've got The Grimrose Girls, written by Laura Pohl. This book is an LGBTQIA plus fantasy, mystery, and young adult book. The mysterious death of their best friend results in Ella, Yuki, and Rora being the talk of their prestigious elite school, The Grimrose Academy. Police have ruled Ariana's death as a suicide, but the trio is determined that something else has happened to her and that she did not commit suicide. So they are determined to find out what actually happened to their best friend. Then Nani Esses, probably really butchered her last name, arrives at the school and becomes the newest roommate of two of the three friends. Um, her arrival sets a whole series of events into motion. Um, that literally nobody could have predicted. Nani goes to the school because her father used to work at the school and has arranged, arranged for her to go to this school. She hasn't seen her father in years and she just wants to find her father and just talk to him again. But once she gets to the school, she discovers that her father is not working at the school anymore. So she makes a deal with the three friends. She's like, I will help you guys figure out what happened to your friend as long as you guys will help me figure out what happened to my father. But once the four start investigating, they discover a very dark secret about the Grimrose Academy and 
that Ariana wasn't the first dead girl in this school. They learn that these murders are all connected to an ancient fairy tale curse that has been put on this school. And their own fates are also tied to the story. Their stories also have brutal and dooming and just very gruesome endings to their lives too. Not if they can break this curse and figure out how it all happened. I swear, this book was so, so, so good. I love this book so much and I really need to read the second book, but it's not out yet, so I'm very annoyed. This book was so good and I barely see anybody talking about it, so I'm talking about it now. Go read this fucking book, you're gonna love it. It's so, so, so good. And that concludes all my seven recommendations. This is probably gonna be a long video, so I apologize in advance for well, myself for adding in this video. I hope you guys really like this video. And if you guys have a lot, and if you guys have any sapphic recommendations, drop them down in the comments below because I'd love to read more sapphic books because I just love sapphic books. Um, yeah, I really hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you guys are gonna read some of these books I recommended. And if you did, let me know down in the comments. Let me know your sapphic recommendations. Give this video a big thumbs up and then I will see you guys in my next video. Bye guys. Thank <music> you.